Praise the Lord, folks. We are live. It is 3 o'clock Sunday afternoon, and we welcome you this afternoon to Dallas, Texas, Grace Oasis, the parent ministry being Grace Oasis Ministries, our local church now being called since 2008, the One Church in Christ Jesus Incorporated. We do not call ourselves the One Church. Uh, <laughs> it is amazing how people have misconstrued and misunderstood the name of our church over the years. It is not the one and only church. We do not call ourselves the only church or the, the One Church that's right and everybody else is wrong. That is not what our name means. Our name is derived from the Apostle Paul's statement to the church at Ephesus uh, when he said, For by one spirit are you all baptized into one body, whether you be Jew or Greek, bond or free, male or female. He said, We are all one in Christ Jesus. And the title of our church, the name of our church, is meant to speak to the fact that God's church is one. There are no divisions, there are no delineations. We do not set people aside, uh, whether they be straight or gay, whether they be black or white, whether they be rich or poor, whether they be pretty or ugly, fat or skinny, uh, whatever the case may be, we are all one church, amen, amen. in Christ Jesus. That is what the name of our church means. So uh, so as to clear up any misconceptions this afternoon. Amen. I am excited about today's message. Uh, we're going to do things a little bit differently today. Facebook is constantly booting us off of uh, being able to do live videos through them, probably because we use... Uh, music in our worship, pre-recorded music, which, mind you, is manufactured and marketed by uh, various companies to be used in this exact fashion. But because we are broadcasting over the Internet, all of a sudden that changes the dynamic and the legality factor. So all of a sudden, you know, when you broadcast over the Internet, it, it becomes something different. And uh, so Facebook is constantly making it so that we cannot share our services live with you because of the pre-recorded worship accompaniment music that we use. So with that in mind, this afternoon I'm going to do things differently. And we're just going to do our service a cappella like we used to do back in the day. Uh, when I was a kid, we didn't have words projected up on a screen. We didn't have all that. We simply sang the choruses and sang the songs. Those of us that knew them sang them, and those of us that didn't know them, uh, if you listen to them one time through, most of the time, they're pretty easy to follow and pretty easy to learn. You know, it's kind of like GPS. If you rely on GPS all the time, after a while you can't find your way out of the house without having to consult Google. Well, the same thing is true in church worship services. I find that so many people in the church today, uh, they don't even know the words to half of the choruses and the songs they sing because they are so accustomed to the words being projected in front of them that if those words are not there, they don't, they don't even know what to sing. So uh, we're just going to do our worship service today a cappella. <coughs> we will be able to sing some choruses that uh, we do not normally get to sing. And uh, so you'll kind of get a little bit of an insight into what it was like when I started my first church back in the mid-80s. Uh, back in those days, I'm one of the only Pentecostal preachers on the planet who does not play a musical instrument. 
Uh, my family was not a musical family. Uh, my family did not go out of their way to encourage us by any stretch of the imagination to study music. We were not uh, given piano lessons or guitar lessons or anything else when we were kids. None of my parents played any instruments. So the only thing I know how to do at all is beat a tambourine and tap on a timbrel. And when I started my first churches uh, back in the mid-1980s, about 1985, um, our services were a cappella, and the people of God clapped their hands while we sang. I taught a bunch of the ladies in particular in our church how to keep time with timbrels, and uh, it was wonderful. We had wonderful church services, and we used to have a marvelous move of God. You know, folks, if you think God can't move except that you've got a drum pounding and an organ being, you know, spanked. That is not true at all. And I pity you because you probably don't know what the true move of God is. Uh, the move of God is not at all dependent upon uh, people being emotionally worked up. It is not at all dependent upon people being stirred up and, and worked into a frenzy by music. God is sovereign and when the Holy Ghost from heaven wants to move, then God will move. Now, I've told the story before, but I remember one service that we had when I was pastoring my very first church. I promise I'll shut up and pray and start momentarily. <clears throat> when I started my very first church, I was back in southern New England, Connecticut, my home state. And I was starting a church there in New England is much more reserved than the South. In the South, uh, Pentecostal churches, the old-time Pentecostal churches, I mean the ladies that shout their hair down, and they, you know, folks that dance and shout and run the aisles. And up north, the move of God was wonderful, but it was different. There was kind of a more reserved nature to it. And... Uh, So when I started my first church in southern New England, uh, I had experienced the South, and I had experienced worship uh, down in Texas and what have you. And uh, I knew, you know, that God could move in this way. Well, that's, I would talk about it to the church as I was preaching, you know. I'd talk about shouting and running the aisles and getting happy and what have you. And the people would all sit there and look at me like deer in the headlights, you know. <laughs> they didn't know what I was talking about because chances are they had never seen it. And they certainly were not inclined to do it, you know, in and of themselves. Then there was this one Sunday we were in the middle of a worship service and all of a sudden, I'll never forget it, uh, I had my eyes closed as we were singing or something. And all of a sudden, I heard a collective shout rise up from the congregation, and I mean it was loud. I'm talking a southern shout. And a southern, the way us folk, us Pentecostal folk in the, in the south shout, if you think you can shout at a ball game just because somebody throws some pigskin across a white line, and that's acceptable, but you can't shout because Jesus saved your soul by the blood of the Lamb, slain on the cross of Calvary. You can't shout because you believe He lives and He reigns today and that God is real and the power of God is real. That's not acceptable. You can't shout over religious things. No, religion's supposed to be, you know, this dead old dry expression, baloney. The word of God said, um, Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Mm -hmm. Shout like a winner. Well, in the South, I'm going to tell you, people shout like a winner. All of a sudden, you'd hear people just go, Woo! 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 You hear 
people shouting all over the church building. The women would let out with some whoops, you know. Whoa! Just shout. I mean, they're feeling the victory. The power of God is touching them, and they just shout. They just let out a shout. Well, all of a sudden, I'm pastoring in southern New England. And one Sunday, I got my eyes closed. We're singing a song or something. A cappella, no music. All of a sudden, I heard this shout rise up in the congregation. And I mean, it was dozens of voices. Probably had about 40, 50 people maybe at that time. I'm hearing all these voices. But the shout sounded unusual to me. It sounded different. And I thought to myself, I mean, all of this happened in a matter of seconds. You know how things play out in your mind. And I thought, Lord, that, that's wonderful. Whatever you're doing, it's wonderful. But why did that shout sound so strange to me? Why did it sound so different? And I opened my eyes and I looked out at the congregation. Of course, I was in the pulpit. And... Every man in the church was on his feet with his hands in every mouth. I'll never, I'll never forget it. It's the most, most amazing thing I've ever seen. And if you don't think God is real, then you need to see this happen. Every man in, in a southern New England church was on his feet with his hands in the air, just shouting at the top of his lungs. No women. When I told my state overseer about this later, my overseer said, Brother, if that wasn't God, nothing was. He said, because traditionally, women tend to be the more expressive. You know, when it comes to worship, women tend to be a little more free in their worship. Men are always kind of more reserved by nature. We, you know, don't want to make a fool out of ourselves. We don't want to embarrass ourselves. So we tend to hold back more, you know, than women do. And he said that had to have been a sight to behold. And I said, Brother Chandler, you wouldn't believe. It was the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. It was like God literally just poured the Holy Ghost out on the men. The women were all sitting in their seats worshiping, you know. But every man was on his feet shouting in good old-fashioned Pentecostal style. And honey, that was the beginning. After that Sunday, we begin to see a move of God in that church. After that Sunday, the Holy Ghost began to move in a brand new way. People say, Pastor, you, I, I watch your programs. I don't see people shouting in your church. I don't say, listen, there are a lot of people in the LGBT Pentecostal community who have nothing better to do than criticize and chide and make fun of and ridicule this pastor. I'm, I'm the laughing stock of our uh, Pentecostal affirming community. Uh, there are people out there who can't stand me. I've been standing for something for so many years, and it irks them and makes them mad. So there are people out there who have been just trying to tear me up for well over two decades now. And I'm, I just keep plugging and doing what God called me to do because I'm never going to answer to those fools. I'm going to answer to Jesus, so I don't care about what they have to say. But there are people out there, I've actually gotten emails from people. How come I don't see this in your church? How come I don't see that in your church? Uh, I'll tell you why. Because I don't get up in the pulpit and cheerlead. You don't see me trying to stir people up emotionally and get them all worked up. You don't see me telling people to shout, telling people to dance, telling people to do thus and so. Because I'm old time Pentecost. I believe in the move of God. I believe the power of God is real. I believe it is completely ignorant and unnecessary for any worship leader or any pastor to do those sort of things. And the only reason they do those things is because there's not enough demonstration in the worship for them. Oh, we want to look 
like we have a move of God. So therefore, we're going to make it look like, you know, oh, we're going to tell people, you should be jumping. You should be running. You should be, why isn't somebody doing this? But, but you know what I'm saying? And it's a cheerleading session. And I've been in Pentecost my whole life, so believe me, I know what I'm talking about. I've seen this garbage when the charismatic movement came into play in the 70s, you began to see more and more and more man-made, man-inspired demonstration during worship and during church services. More and more of it. You began to see a whole lot more of preachers pushing people over. You know, the Benny Hinn effect. Because after all, your church looks like it has a move of God when people are falling out in the aisles and people come up for prayer and they fall out when you lay hands on them. And oh, that makes it look like there's much more of a move of God. So it's okay if you fake it because that it makes it look like there's a move of God. Well, I got news for you, honey. This preacher don't fake nothing. If you ever see anything happen in this church, if you ever hear anybody shout, including me, if you ever hear anybody talk in tongues, including me, if you ever see anybody slain in the spirit, if you ever see anybody running the aisles, if you ever see anybody dancing in the Holy Ghost, it will be God That's right. who is bringing that about. Because I refuse to surrender to the counterfeit spirit that is and that was born of the charismatic movement. And I got so there's a lot of people out there going to be mad at me, but I'm telling you the truth. That garbage was created by and perpetrated by the charismatic movement. I knew pastors when I was a kid had pastors who were wonderful men of God. And when they came into our church, uh, one pastor in particular came to the church that I was uh, born and raised in. He was a wonderful man, Tommy. I'm telling you, I loved him. Old time Pentecost, woo! We used to have a move of God. And do you know, he constantly invited singing groups to come in. And you know, he, he brought in a lot of these visiting things. Well, he began to be influenced by them. All of a sudden, you notice that literally, even the way he dressed was, was changed by the way these people would dress, you know. There was a common practice, a lot of these charismatic preachers, I, I don't know why they did it, but they used to love to wear a big old cross on the outside of their tie back in the day, you know, on a chain. And they'd run around and they'd have that cross on. Well, you know, why that is, I'll never know. All of a sudden, this pastor began to do that. Never done it before. All of a sudden, he's doing it now. I went up for prayer one time. And I kid you not, I was never so disgusted. I've told you how I was twice slain in the Spirit in my life. I don't include this experience because this experience was not being slain in the Spirit. This was garbage. And this man did it to me twice over the years. Not just once, but twice. And anyway, I went up for prayer one time and he pulled that stud where he kind of hit my head in such a way that literally I lost balance. I was knocked right off of my feet. All because the way he did a sudden jerk of my head, you know. And he did that with everybody he prayed for. Oh, that church has such a move of God. There's such a move of God. And one of my aunts, my mother's sisters, she and some of the people in the church saw what was going on. I was still a teenager. They saw what was happening and they began to pray, Lord, get rid of this man. Get him out of our church. He was literally trading, folks. Listen to me. This is scary. He was trading the sovereign move of God for a counterfeit. He literally was exchanging it. Why? Because the counterfeit he could control. He could control how often 
we had demonstrative services. He could control how often it appeared that God was moving and God, you know what I'm saying? Whereas when you simply rely upon the sovereign move of God, there are going to be some services that are quiet and passive and you know, which is fine as long as God's in it. Then there are going to be other services that are loud and shouting and demonstrative. But a lot of preachers, even in the Pentecostal movement, fell victim uh, in the 70s and 80s. They fell victim to the charismatic movement. And they began because they could control all this foolishness. When I started my first church in the 1980s, mid-1980s, I think it was about 1985, I had a man who came to my church after a while, and he played keyboards. He was a very gifted keyboardist. He had two keyboards, one on top of the other on a mounted, you know, one above the other. And he played them. And he was good at what he played. And he had come to my church from an Assemblies of God church that I was very familiar with. And the pastor... I had known since I was a kid. I remember this guy long before he began to pastor. Long before he began to pastor. And this man, from the get-go, had gone the way of the charismatic movement. Everything was about singing songs. Uh, the charismatic movement had one trait that to this day I hate with a passion. They would sing certain choruses and certain songs and they would start it out very slow. Then the next round, they would go a little bit faster. The next round, they'd go a little bit faster. The next round, they'd go a little bit faster. And because of this technique, it would kind of work people up into a frenzy. So by the time you got to singing it really fast, you know, people were all bouncing and, you know, and all carrying on. And so this was a technique, and I told this fellow who started coming to my church, and he offered to play keyboards. That was the beginning of us having live music in my first church, and we weren't that old. We were only about maybe five months old when he came in, and uh, the church that is. And I told him right off the cuff, I said, now here's, here's the one thing I'm going to tell you right now. We do not use charismatic music in our service. I said, if we're having an altar service or if we're having prayer for people or whatever, and I hear you start playing this charismatic crap, I will come over and I will shut it down. Don't bring that garbage into this church. We're not a charismatic church. We're a Holy Ghost fire baptized Pentecostal church. We don't work anything up. We let God bring it down. Amen. Well, he did well for the most part. There were times he'd say to me, would you like to sing this? And I said, nope, that song is not going to be sung in our church. We're not going to use that chorus in our church. Then one Sunday he started playing something, and I said, ho, 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 no, 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 no. And I walked over to him. We were having prayer in the altars and stuff. I walked over to him. I said, Brother, you remember what I told you? Well, now is the time, Brother. We don't use that in this church. Let's go to something else. And he did. And we used to have services in that church, folks. We were in southern New England. And we had services. We saw people healed in that church. Our church had a reputation all over the state. I had people call me from all over the country who needed healing, who needed deliverance from demons because they had heard about our church. This is before the Internet. I didn't even know how these people had heard about our church. I went to a gas station one time to buy gas. And back in the day, <laughs> some of you young people won't remember this, there used to be gas stations that offered full service, you know, the before everything went self-service. And the gas guy come out, you know, to my car, said, what, what would you like? I said, fill her up. 
And while the tank was filling up, he was kind of talking to me through the window of my car. And he asked me something like, well, where do you work at or something like that? I said, well, I pastor a little church here in the valley. He said, oh, really, what church is that? Maybe I've heard of you. I said, oh, I doubt that. Because we were a new church, you know. We weren't but six months old or at best a year, you know. And I figure, who on earth would know us, you know, who would have heard of it? So I told him, I said, well, it's called Holiness Tabernacle, Church of God. He said, oh, I've heard all about your church. And when he said that, I'll never forget it. I, I kind of, you know, what? And I, looked at, I said, oh, I doubt that. I said, I can't imagine you had. He said, oh, yes, oh, yes. He said, uh, uh, somebody I know, I can't remember how we knew her, but anyway, he said, she was healed in your church. She had ovarian cancer, and she, God healed her in your church. And I said, oh, you mean Celine? And I'm not saying her last name right now on purpose, but, you know, I said, Celine. And he said, yes, that's her. I said, oh, I said, well, I guess you have heard of our church then. He said, my Lord, yes. He said, I've had people come through here, and in the process of talking to them, they told me, have you heard about this new church here in the valley? Good God, things are happening over there like you wouldn't believe. Honey. The power of God began to fall in that church. We had services that the churches in the South wished they had. We had services, I kid you not, where the Spirit of the Lord fell. People shouted, women, men, all over that building. People begin to be slain by the Holy Ghost. Nobody touching them. Nobody even laying hands on them. Just standing in the pew. All of a sudden their body give out. And they fall out in the aisles. People coming in being healed of everything. From brain tumors. to Oh my God, I'll never forget it. Just the healings were amazing. We had all kinds of healing. We were casting demons out of people. We wound up having to move to a storefront. Across the street from a, I'm reminiscing for a moment, I hope you all bear with me. We had to move into a storefront across the street from a car dealer. We were trying to make room for the church because we were growing. I'm telling you, we had visitors and our visitor to membership ratio was like 90%. 90% of the people who visited stayed and became members of our church. The Holy Ghost started to fall in our church, and we literally didn't have room in the storefront that we were in to shout and have church. People would go out into the street. They'd go out onto the sidewalk, and you'd have people out on the sidewalk shouting and worshiping God. Literally, you talk about genuine. This wasn't put on. This was real. And I mean the power of God. And people would pull over on the side of the road and they would go in between the cars at the car dealership and look across the street and watch us shouting like a bunch of lunatics. That is Pentecost. That is God. That is the sovereign move of God. And I've got news for you, honey. This preacher believes exactly glory to God. This preacher believes today exactly the same way he used to believe. And I'm still believing God to move like that. I'm still believing God. I need a church like this. And I'm still believing God for that. <laughs> And I know it's coming. I know it'll happen. Because God is God and God is real and the power of God is real and you don't have to do jack to make anything happen. Mm -hmm. All you've got to do is have a heart and a mind to allow God. Brother Gillum, my, the greatest mentor in ministry, and Christian living that I've ever had in my life told me years ago, he said, Chuck, the key to the move of God is simple. Because his church had a move of God like you wouldn't believe. He said, the key is simple to the move of God. He said, let God be God.
That was his advice. That's how you experience a move of God. Not play fast songs. Not get you a drummer who can beat that thing like he's trying to raise zombies from the dead. No. He said, let God be God. He said, when God starts to move in the church, he said the biggest mistake worship leaders make, the biggest mistake the pastor makes, they get in the way. Mm -hmm. He said, you let God be God. He's the, run, he's the one who runs the church. Jesus is the head of the church, not you. So if the service is going in a certain direction, by the Spirit of God, he said, then let it go in that direction. He said, you know, a lot of preachers act like, well, bless God, I've got a message, so that means I'm supposed to preach. He said, but God knows who's coming into that service. God knows what they need. You don't know what they need. God knows what they need. He said, if the Spirit of the Lord begins to move in the church, service, he said, that may be a service when God don't want no preaching that Sunday. He wants to just minister to people through the altar service. He wants to minister to people through prayer and worship. He said, just let God be God. He said, the best thing you'll ever do is learn how to stay out of God's way. I took that advice, and to this day, I still, still embrace that advice. The best thing you can do is just let God be God. Let God do whatever He's going to do and stay out of His way. You don't have to do anything for him. You don't have to manufacture a counterfeit move of God. Because, honey, a counterfeit move of God is what half these television charlatans are doing, okay? Half these TV preachers and half the garbage you see on the Internet is counterfeit. It's not real. I want to tell you a little secret. You can... The difference between the real and the counterfeit is like night and day. When I started my first church back in 85 or so, a lot of the people who came to my very first church were coming from charismatic and heavily charismatic influenced churches. I had people coming into my church, Tommy, and we'd be having altar service, you know, or they'd come down because every service we began in the altars, every service. The people would come down and start praying before church began, and we started every service this way. I didn't have to ask anybody. I didn't have to beg anybody. I have ever since day one of being in affirming ministry, and to this day, not one soul has ever listened to me and done what I've asked and instructed, but I didn't have to go through this garbage when I was pastoring my early church. The people of God knew. Church started at 7. Then at 7 o'clock, they'd be in the altars praying. And I don't mean at 7 o'clock they'd start coming down to the altars. I mean when 7 o'clock hit, we were already there. Some of them be there since 6. Some of them be there since 5.30. Because some people actually enjoy praying. What do you know? Did you know that you can get benefits from praying before church? Did you know that you can actually get yourself in a mindset to receive something from God? Did you know you can pray down the move of God and the power of God before church if you just invest a little time in the presence of the Lord one-on-one -on -one without it being a corporate worship service? Did you know I grew up in a church that knew that? And I told people, said, when we start service, I want to be able at the hour that our service begins, I want to be able to look up and see every person in the church in the altar praying. Or if you're not in the altars, be kneeling at your pew or whatever the case might be. And that's what we do. We do people be all over the sanctuary kneeling in their seats and what have you praying. People be in the altars praying. And uh, what how we knew to move on in the service when time came to begin I'd get on the microphone and I would just begin to pray an opening prayer when I finished and said amen everybody would get up from the altars and they'd find their way back to their seats and we moved on with the service 
from there. I love, I love reminiscing about these things. I could do it all day. I wish I could do it all day. Because the move of God that is real versus a counterfeit, pardon my use of the term, crapola, church service. There'd be people praying in the altar before church, and I'd, I'd see these people. And Tommy knows what I'm talking about because we've seen this in some churches we have visited in the past years since we've been in Dallas. Somebody be in the altar. Like this, literally. And they're making noises like this. And they're just as loud as you please, and they're just carrying on. And I guess they want to call themselves talking in tongues. But you don't feel the Holy Ghost in it. You don't nope. feel the Spirit of the Lord in it. Tommy, when I started my first church, I had people coming from charismatic churches, from Assemblies of God, up in the Northeast, the Assemblies of God was hard hit by the charismatic movement. I'm going to tell you, whew, wiped out the move of God in our, in our part of the country. Wiped it out dead. And you had all this counterfeit garbage going on, including people believing they received the Holy Ghost because in these charismatic churches their doctrine was all screwed up. They were telling people, they were teaching them how to talk in tongues. They were literally telling people basically, you know, well I'm praying for you. If you hear me speak in tongues then you just imitate what you're hearing. I mean, you wouldn't believe the garbage that they were teaching people. And I had people come into our church from these charismatic churches, from these heavily charismatic influenced churches, and they believed with all their heart that they had received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And this pastor was kind enough to let them, you know, stay in their delusion for a while. I knew better. But then I had people come to me tears streaming down their face after church and they said to me pastor I thought I had the Holy Ghost I was going to brother so and so's church for four years and I thought I got the Holy Ghost I spoke in tongues they didn't have the Holy Ghost they had what I call a tongues experience which again can be manufactured if you're not careful Said, I thought I had the Holy Ghost said, but tonight, during our service, I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and they knew they did. Because the real, compared to the counterfeit, is like night and day. When you genuinely receive the Holy Ghost, and you genuinely begin to worship God and speak and pray in an unknown tongue, it is, it is the most amazing thing in the world. And I, I, I can still to this day, I can remember, I could name names of people who came to me and told me this. I received the Holy Ghost today. I thought I had the Holy Ghost, but I received the baptism today. Folks, I'm here to tell you, when you join us online, we don't claim to be the only church. We don't claim to be the only right church. We don't claim you've got to be part of our church to be saved or to be in the truth. That is not at all what this church is saying. But I am going to tell you, if you, if you want a pastor, straight, gay, or otherwise, who is committed 100% to the genuine move and power of God, then you found the right church. That's right. That is what this church is committed to. And what you're going to see over the years, whether you view it in person or whether you observe it online, you're going to see things change. You're going to see things happening over time that are quite a bit different than what you see today. And that's all right because I'm waiting on God and I'm letting God move in His sovereign will according to His plan, His purpose, and His design. Amen. Amen.